Hey ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Uh, as you can see, we're about to start unit three. So we are moving along the semester, grinding through, learning about our bodies, learning about anatomy and physiology. Hope you're hanging in there. Uh, so I wanted to throw this out. You know, at this point in the semester, you know, it's a good, good idea to maybe revisit those uh, historical, current, and future self-reflections that I talked about the very first day. Uh, you know, kind of thinking about uh, who you are as a learner, where are you at in this class right now, how's your grade, how are you performing, have you seen your grades go up, are you seeing your grades go down, what might be affecting it, is it this new mode of learning, uh, is it the semester, you know, where are we at, you know, at right, right now it's um, a week before the semester uh, for me to record this message um, and so you know who knows where we're at actually now when you're listening to this so um, you know revisit these questions think about how you're doing where are you at how are you going to continue on a trajectory of doing well how can you improve until the end of the semester um, and if you're not in a spot right now where you're doing well you know, have you started seeking out resources, tutoring, SI, office hours uh, to, to change your study habits? So again, take a few moments and, and reflect on this, you know, do this outside, maybe go for a nice walk, uh, hang out, and um, yeah, let's move on with, uh, with our next unit. So where have we been? I'd like to point a few things out here. So we started with unit one and we looked at uh, anatomy and physiology, we talked about the importance of form and function, and then we talked about homeostasis and a lot of different types of you know, orientation in our body, different regions, different um, terminology to help us orient ourselves. Then we went into cells and membranes and diffusion and ion channels, right, and osmosis. Then we talked about tissues, our integumentary system, and bone, and now, here we are with nervous tissue. And so where are we going for the rest of the semester? Uh, we're gonna be talking about action potentials. We're gonna be talking about ions and ion channels. Uh, we're gonna be talking about communication within our body, so a little bit uh, bigger uh, pathways there. And then we're gonna move into us uh, connecting our nervous system into different pathways in the body. And so we'll be learning about specific paths and, and how those are interconnected. And then we're gonna finish the semester with our muscles. And again, we'll be talking about action potentials and communication from a neuron to muscles and, and learn about how those ions and ion channels are affecting uh, our muscles. Now, if you look back, uh, we've got ion channels, ion channels, ion channels, action potentials, communication. So a lot of what we've been learning about uh, is, is permeating throughout the semester. And so if you're struggling in any of these areas as far as what ions are, are what, what those actual ions are doing, like sodium and potassium, um, if you're struggling with the plasma membrane and the movement of these ions through those channels, you really need to spend some time refreshing that and, and getting a good handle before we move on because you're gonna see this over and over again. This is really foundational for these next few units. So I uh, just wanted to throw that out there just so you have a little bit of a heads up as to what to expect as we're moving forward. You know, at this point in the semester, uh, people that are struggling with the content are just kind of right on the edge uh, of, the, of the content and, right on their edge of their limits of, of sanity, if you will. Um, this can sometimes make you or break you, and so we need you know, to make sure that you are getting over that hurdle and, and really having a good understanding so we can move forward and finish strong with this semester. Now, uh, we're gonna be talking a lot about uh, the different types of channels and how they're transporting, so again, refresh on this information. So here's what we're gonna do. <clears throat> uh, we are going to watch two quick videos and I want you to think about what these videos have to do with neurons. Ooh. 
<laughs> okay. So there's one. Do a full screen. That's it. Pause your video. Take a moment. What do these two things have to do with neurons? So we'll be revisiting this a little bit later in our lecture. So let's talk about our subdivisions of our nervous system first. Now, when we talk about coordination or communication, I should say, in our, um, in our bodies, we do that two ways. And we do that through our endocrine system, which is hormonal where we're sending uh, chemical messages. And we do that through our nervous system. And the nervous system is utilizing electrical signals as well as chemical messengers. Uh, and so in the nervous system, we'll be talking about neurotransmitters. In the endocrine system, we talk about hormones. And these uh, neurons are gonna use electrical and chemical signals to communicate with each other. As you can see over here to the right, we've got our central nervous system. Uh, so our brain and our spinal cord, and we have everything else, our peripheral nervous system, branching off of that. And if you remember, we talked about afferent and afferent pathways. We're going to see how this all ties into here. So what does the nervous system do? Well, it's receiving information. So uh, all of the information that's coming from our external and internal environment, we have these receptors. Those receptors are sensing different types of information. The brain and spinal cord are processing that information. So as information is coming into our receptors, those receptors are sending messages along the afferent pathway back to control centers. And generally our brain and spinal cord are gonna process that information and then figure out what's going on and create some kind of command and that's gonna travel out of the central nervous system through these afferent pathways back to our effectors, which in a lot of cases are muscles and glands. Now, here's that diagram. It hasn't gone away. We've been looking at this since unit one, so make sure you got a good understanding of this. Just to uh, bring back a, another sort of perspective on here, sensory input, and we can see over here, we see a glass of water. Uh, that information is sent back into our integration centers, and then we say, oh, we're thirsty. That looks delicious. I think I'll pick it up and drink it now. And we send a signal back through our motor output or our efferent response to pick that glass of water up and drink it and enjoy it. And let's put on our laser pointer here so we have that. Now let's divide up our nervous system into our divisions, right? We always wanna start big and then work a little bit smaller so we get a better understanding of where we're at. Again, we have our central nervous system on the left and we have our peripheral nervous system on the right, the brain and spinal cord, and then all of the nerves that are coming off of there. Now we can divide this into regions. So our central nervous system is divided into the brain and the spinal cord. And our peripheral nervous system is divided into a sensory division and a motor division. That sensory division can then further be divided into a visceral sensory division. So viscera, organs, information that is being picked up by our organs or our somatic sensory division. So uh, structures in our body, soma is body. If you remember um, learning about a cell body, we call it a soma. Um, so a somatic net sensory division is picking up information coming out of our bodies. In our motor division, we have the visceral motor division, so signals that are gonna to go to our organs to control them. And we have our somatic motor division, signals that are gonna to go to the rest of our body. And you can see here that the visceral motor division is further divided into our sympathetic and our parasympathetic divisions. And so uh, sympathetic is our fight or flight and parasympathetic is our rest and relax. 
Now let's look just at our peripheral nervous system. We can divide that peripheral nervous system into our sensory and our motor divisions. Okay, our sensory divisions are our afferent pathways. So we have our receptors that are picking up some kind of information, a stimulus from the external or internal environment, and we're sending it back to a control center. So we have our sensory division, our afferent division, and then we have our motor division, so signals coming out of that control center back to our effectors. And we're gonna have some kind of uh, movement. That sensory division, uh, which we just kind of went over, carrying signals from our receptors to our central nervous system, and our motor division is carrying signals from the central nervous system uh, to our effectors. If we divide our sensory division into the somatic sensory and our visceral sensory, we can see that that somatic sensory division includes uh, information coming from receptors that are in our skin, our muscles, our bones, our joints. Right? And so we're going to try to figure out our place in this world. What are our, what are our joints doing? How are they feeling? And there's proprioceptors. What about balance and movement, right? Our visceral sensory then is coming from our heart, our lungs, our stomach, the bladder, sending information back to that central nervous system. If we look at the motor division, we can divide that into the somatic and the visceral divisions. And again, information going back from the central nervous system to our skeletal muscles. And then the visceral is taking signals out to our glands, uh, to our smooth muscle, to our cardiac muscle. No voluntary control here. And that visceral division is divided into the fight or flight and rest and relax. So our sympathetic is going to uh, stimulate um, stimulate us into action, right? Um, it's gonna kind of wake us up. It's gonna, it's this fight or flight reaction and it's gonna actually inhibit our digestion. We don't need to be sending energy to our, uh, our organs uh, while, while we're trying to, to fight or flight. The parasympathetic Division then is relaxing us, it's calming us down, uh, and, and it's kind of maintaining our body while we're at rest. All right, let's take a little bit and just digest all that. That's a lot of organization. All right, how to, how to go. Hopefully you are making a little bit of sense of our divisions of our nervous system. So let's look at the universal properties of neurons. Now, all neurons are excitable, meaning they respond to stimuli or they respond to some kind of environmental change. And when they respond to that change, they conduct electrical signals uh, through their cell bodies and down their axons to another cell. And at the end of the axon, they secrete neurotransmitters. And those neurotransmitters are the way that they communicate with the next cell. So they'll cross a gap called the synapse. Some of that may be familiar from Psych 101 if you remember that. So to put this in perspective, you can see here we have our stimulus. That stimulus um, is picked up by a receptor. It sends in information down through the sensory neuron and will go back to a processing center, or in this case, an interneuron, which then um, sends a signal out through our motor neuron to our effectors and creates some kind of response. So sensory or afferent neurons away from the receptor, remember that, and they are bringing in that information, okay? And so they're gonna be excited by that stimulus, and then they're gonna conduct that signal down uh, and back into the control center where they will communicate right here chemically with those neurotransmitters. Inner neurons then are between the afferent and the afferent uh, neurons. There's, they make up about 90% of the central nervous system and they play a role in integration and, and control. And then we see our motor neurons coming out, taking information from the CNS back to those specific effectors. Great. 
So here we are, uh, we've sort of digested the difference between the two systems that we're going to be looking at today. Now, if we move forward, we're going to start looking at the structure of a neuron and then classifying neurons. So there's a lot of terminology on this page here, and we're going to go over this fairly slowly, but we want to digest this neuron. Um, little piece of advice, you can expect to see this neuron pop up on a quiz or a test, and you'll have to be able to identify structures or uh, answer questions that are you know, specific to the neuron here. Now, our soma, we mentioned earlier, somatic nervous division um, is our body or our cell body here. So you can see we've got the nucleus and the nucleolus inside of our cell body here. Um, it's made up of microtubules and neurofibrils, um, bundles of actin filaments, right? And so that makes up our cytoskeleton. You don't actually see centrioles in here, which limit cell division. The dendrites then kind of look like the, the hair. Uh, you can almost think of this cell in this image as sort of like a cyclops. And so here's its head with its eye in the middle, and here's this crazy hairdo. Uh, the dendrites branch uh, off of that cell body and they are receiving information from other neurons. So information comes into the neuron, it, or sorry, comes into the dendrite, is passed down the dendrite through the cell body, and then continues in a one-way path to the next cell. The axon then is the other really large structure that we see here. And so it starts and originates from a region called the axon hillock. This is our trigger zone. Uh, we'll get into this when we talk a little bit more about action potentials, but you can think of the trigger zone. Trigger zone, hmm, did we watch a video about that? Um, and so this is kind of where our action potentials will begin firing is from this trigger zone and they'll be passed down our axon. So it's mostly unbranched uh, for most of its length, but has lots of branches on this distal end down here, as you can see down here, so that it can communicate with other neurons or other dendrites. Uh, we see one axon per neuron and we see that we have a myelin sheath. Uh, and that myelin sheath is made up of Schwann cells or oligodendrocytes, and we'll talk more about uh, the difference between the two types of cells. At the end of that uh, axon, we see this, um, the, the axon is dividing, and at the very terminal end, we have what's called the synaptic knobs, and this is where neurotransmitters are gonna be released to communicate with the dendrite of another neuron. Now, a couple of other things to note is that we'll see some different, um, we'll see different terminology, and depending on whether or not we're talking about the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system is, is specific to the word that we use. So if we talk about a collection of axons, a whole bunch of them, uh, and we can call axons fibers, we will call that a tract. But in the peripheral nervous system, and we see a bunch of axons or a fiber, uh, we call that a nerve. And so it's sort of like splitting hairs, but as you can see up here, we see the optic nerve. So this is denoting that this nerve is in the peripheral nervous system. But once it makes its way back into the central nervous system, we call it an optic tract. So it's the same thing, it's still transmitting a signal down here, it's just in a different division. And so that's a, uh, important when you're saying, well, there's damage to the optic nerve versus there's damage to the optic tract. We, we have a better idea of what system we're dealing with. If you remember back to our first unit, we talked about a lot of variation in the human body. Well, the same thing is true with our neurons. We have a lot of variation in neuron structure. So there's different types of neurons that you'll be required to know. The first is called multipolar neurons. These neurons have one axon and multiple, multiple, many, 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 many dendrites, as you can see here. So this guy's got crazy hair, crazy hair here. These are our most common neurons. 
Um, and most of the neurons in our central nervous system uh, look like these multipolar neurons. Now, you might say, well, why are all of these, why does it have so many dendrites? Well, if you think about that, all of those dendrites are integrating with um, the synaptic knobs of other neurons. So these dendrites have a lot of outreach. These are kind of like, um, you can think of them as like your social butterfly friends that, you know, you're like, geez, that person knows everybody on campus, right? So uh, they just really have these branches all over the place and they can receive lots of input. Then we have bipolar neurons. Bipolar, they're happy one day and sad the next. Uh, but they actually have one axon and one dendrite, and that dendrite splits a little bit uh, off of their um, main branch here. We generally see these bipolar neurons uh, in our olfactory cells, in our retina, uh, in our inner ear. And then we have pseudo-unipolar neurons. Uh, these neurons, they have a single process. Uh, that leads away from their body, and they have this really long axon. They generally are, are sensory receptors that we see in our skin and our organs that lead back to our uh, central nervous system. So up here would maybe be our touch receptors in our fingers, and as we touch something, we're gonna see that there's stimulation that's transferred down this dendrite, all the way down this axon, all the way back into our central nervous system. So this one neuron, when you think about that, is transmitting information down a single neuron all the way back to my central nervous system. So these things are pretty long, uh, and they can transmit information really quick along that length. And our last one is the anexonic neuron. Uh, they have lots of dendrites, but they don't have an axon. And again, they help in our visual processes. Uh, we won't spend a whole lot of time talking about these guys. Now this image is gonna highlight a few things for us. First off, let's look here. We've got three types of neurons that we just talked about, our multipolar, our bipolar, and our pseudo-unipolar neurons. Uh, we're gonna refer to them as pseudo-unipolar. Pseudo uh, unipolar has sort of a different meaning, and so we're gonna just call them pseudo-unipolar. Now, if we look at the coloration in these diagrams, blue is our receptive region, and this is generally where we have chemically gated ion channels. Uh, and so if you remember, ligand gated ion channels. And so this is where we're going to receive the stimulus. So we can see the blue on here, the blue over here, and the blue over here. And we can see that that size variation changes depending on the type of neuron we're looking at. Here in red, we have the conducting region. And so that conducting region is transmitting that action potential down its axon along the way to its terminus. And then we have our secretory region in green. Uh, on these images, we don't see a whole lot of variation between the three, uh, but down here, we're gonna see that that uh, is receptive to calcium so that neurotransmitters can be released, which if you think back to our bone lecture when we talked about the, the reason to monitor blood homeostasis, uh, or calcium homeostasis, I should say, um, is that we need calcium to help us transmit signals from neuron to neuron. So we can see the differences between these three types of neurons, and we can also see where their trigger zone is located meaning we have to have some kind of stimulus that's going to create a signal. And if you think about a gun, if you pull on a trigger, that trigger has a little bit of play, but at some point when you pull it all the way, that bullet is going to come out. Okay. And so again, here, this trigger zone is kind of uh, the reference for sending an action potential at this point down our uh, axon. Great! We have talked about our neurons and we've talked about their variation. So let's practice a little bit before we move on. Go ahead and pause your video and I'll see you here in a minute. All right, welcome back. Let's move on. What we want to talk about now are neuroglia. 
Neuroglia are cells that are going to support our neurons and they're going to offer assistance to our neurons. They're going to help uh, regulate ions. Uh, they got all kinds of functions that we're going to be looking at. So when we talk about neuroglia cells, there are about a trillion neurons in our nervous system. That's a lot of neurons. But when you look at neuroglia, they outnumber our neurons by about 50 to 1. So there's about 50 times as many neuron, uh, neuroglia as there are neurons. That's like mind-blowing, right? So uh, what are they going to do? They're going to have all kinds of functions here for us. So supporting and protecting those neurons. Those neurons are really important and they need a little bit of help. They help bind neurons together and they will sort of form a framework again for our nervous tissue. They help neurons migrate to their final destination. So during fetal development, your neurons move. Uh, they need to get into the right spot. And so those glial cells will help with that. They insulate, and so they help prevent the transmission of signals between neurons where they're not supposed to happen. So they keep mature neurons from coming in contact with each other. Um, and they do that by helping create much more precise pathways. Now there's six that we're going to be looking at. The first is our astrocytes. We'll look at microglial cells, satellite cells, epidemal cells, oligodendrocytes, and Schwann cells. And you heard me mention those earlier in the lecture. So the first type are our astrocytes. These are the most abundant glial cells in our bodies. You can see down here, they are wrapping around capillaries uh, and they're highly, highly branched. We find them covering our entire brain surface and they're very, very versatile. They help provide nutrients for our neurons and they're removing excess neurotransmitters. So at the synapses, when, neuro, when neurotransmitters are released, uh, we need to get those neurotransmitters out of there so that we can kind of clean, uh, clean up the area so that we're not having communication when it's not supposed to be happening. So these uh, astrocytes will help remove those excess neurotransmitters. They're in, they play a role in ion regulation and uh, they are in sort of the gatekeepers uh, with material exchange or nutrient exchange between blood vessels and neurons. Um, so you can see right in here, they're wrapping all the way around that capillary. So anything that's coming in or out of that capillary has to go through them, okay? They're the guards. Our microglia, again, you can see uh, they're very branched, but they're very small macrophages, so they're gonna gobble up any debris or pathogens. They're phagocytizing that dead tissue, uh, looking for anything that's not supposed to be there. And during injury, these microglia will migrate because they're gonna phagocytize any of that uh, dead material or anything that's foreign. And then our epidemal cells. Our epidemal cells, they should look fairly similar to you. They look fairly cuboidal or columnar, uh, and they've got these nice little extensions over here, uh, some cilia coming off of their plasma membranes. So they have these little root-like processes that are integrating into that brain or the spinal cord tissue. We find these inside your brain in the ventricles and they're going to produce cerebrospinal fluid, CSF. And those uh, cilia there help, they beat and they help to circulate that cerebrospinal fluid throughout our ventricular system. We find them in various cavities of the central nervous system. You'll be learning about that in labs. And then we have our oligodendrocytes. So our oligodendrocytes can branch and they can have up to 15 different arms and those arms wrap around nerve fibers so you can see here that this one oligodendrocyte is reaching out and branching around and then wrapping around each of these nerve fibers so creating insulation and that myelin in the brain and our spinal cord so these oligodendrocytes are found in the central nervous system uh, here's just an image again, just highlighting the myelination of that oligodendrocyte around each of those nerve fibers.
Now, in the peripheral nervous system, we have our satellite cells, which we can see here in pink around that cell body, and our Schwann cells. You may also come across the term neural lemocyte. You can just refer to it as a Schwann cell. It's a little bit easier, much less of a mouthful there. Uh, and so we'll just be using Schwann cell moving forward. So what do those satellite cells do? We can see that they're surrounding those cell bodies. They are providing insulation around those cell bodies so that we don't get any unnecessary signals transmitted through them. And they're helping to regulate that chemical environment around those neurons. So they're managing and monitoring um, that those ion distributions and what's outside of that chemical environment. And that's gonna give information to our cells and our neurons to kind of understand where we at with these resting membrane potentials and our, our um, ion concentrations. Now Schwann cells, uh, you can see down here in blue, these Schwann cells wrap around the nerve fibers in our peripheral nervous system. Uh, but one Schwann cell only wraps around uh, one spot, whereas with the oligodendrocytes, we saw lots of branching. The Schwann cells are different. These are producing the myelin sheath, um, and they help in regeneration of damaged nerve fibers. If you look at the myelin sheath, it's a layer of insulation around that fiber, just like we have electrical lines that are traveling all over our planet. We wrap them in in rubber or in, uh, in insulation. Um, but in this case, we want to do the same thing with our neurons. We don't want those electrical signals jumping to other uh, neurons. And so when we look at that myelin sheath, it's made mostly of lipids, about 80%, about 20% protein. Now here's a little closer look at these. Uh, what do they do? What does this myelin do for us? Well, it's insulating. but by insulating those nerve fibers, it's also increasing the transmission speed of those signals, which is really, really important. When we feel something or touch something that's dangerous or hot or sharp, uh, we want that signal to transmit as rapidly as possible. So we find that along our axons. And in between those, um, those cells, we find what's called the nodes of Ranvier. Uh, and this is where action potentials actually jump. It's called saltatory conduction, and they'll be jumping from a node to a node to a node to a node. And again, here's just one last comparison so you can see the difference between the two. Um, we've got our uh, oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system, highly branched. They can reach and wrap around up to 60 different axons where the Schwann cells, uh, we just have a Schwann cell here, Schwann cell here, Schwann cell here. They're more individualistic, where these are like, you know, team players, right? Now let's differentiate between white matter and gray matter. White matter are collections of myelinated fibers, and gray matter are mostly neuron cell bodies and unmyelinated fibers. So that, those Schwann cells, those oligodendrocytes, they're mostly composed of lipids, and that gives them a white appearance when we look at them through cross-section. You can see here in this brain, a lot of our white matter myelinated sheaths of, of our fibers are on the inner region of our brain, where we have a lot of this gray matter on the outside. So cell bodies and unmyelinated fibers. Now, if we look at the conduction speed being transmitted through nerve fibers, that speed depends on the diameter of the fiber and the presence or absence of myelin. So if we look at larger fibers, they have more surface area. And if you have more surface area, uh, you can conduct signals quickly or fast, much more quickly, because that conduction is traveling along the surface of that fiber. And then when you add myelin to it and you insulate it, we're going to learn how that speeds up the transmission down that nerve fiber. I mentioned it before when we said saltatory conduction, when we're jumping uh, between those nodes of Ranvier. Now, uh, you don't need to memorize this. This is just to kind of, I don't know, put this into perspective for you. Uh, a small unmyelinated fiber is anywhere between a half to two meters per second. 
um, where a small myelinated fiber is 3 to 15 meters per second. So by adding in that myelination, you're getting a pretty giant increase in transmission speed. If you have a really large fiber, then now we're talking up to 120 meters per second. So that's pretty fast. So you may be asking, well, why do we care about transmission speed? Shouldn't we have fast signals all the time? Well, when we look at organs like our stomach or our pupil, speed isn't as much of an issue. Uh, we don't need to just rapidly start digesting everything, okay? If it takes its time a little bit, that's all right. But if we look at moving our um, skeletal muscles or transmitting information about vision or hearing or we're you know, in a fight or flight situation, we need to have as fast of a signal as possible. So we might have unmyelinated or smaller fibers going into organs like the stomach or a pupil where we're going to have larger uh, fibers uh, that are myelinated going to muscles and our sensory signals. So go ahead and take another few minutes, pause your video, practice these questions, and I'll see you back here. All right, now, I want to just real quick go over a few things to refresh all of our brains. So we have, uh, this is just a different perspective on dividing up our nervous system. So again, we've got our central nervous system. Here's our brain and our spinal cord. There's a lot going on in this image, so bear with me. We've got our peripheral nervous system, uh, which are our cranial nerves and spinal nerves, and they're gonna communicate with the central nervous system and the rest of the body. Down here in our key, we can see structure in, with a, a, a little circle, and we've got a black square here that is representing function. So you can look at all of these uh, as far as what structures are being innervated and what are the functions, right? Um, in blue, we have our sensory fibers, and in red, we have our uh, motor or our efferent uh, fibers coming in. So you can learn a lot about how this integrates um, by looking and spending some time digesting this, this diagram. So I won't go over this a whole lot, but I wanted to just point this out and walk you through here just to help you build on what we've already talked about and to tie in uh, some of the definitions uh, and, and characteristics of the nervous system that we've looked at. Again, I'm putting this in here because it's important. Make sure you know this. We talked about this with blood pressure, right? And we talked about um, how when we stand up our blood pressure falls and then we need to correct it. And we're doing that homeostatic balance of blood pressure via our nervous system. We are monitoring our temperature homeostasis with our nervous system. We're regulating our blood glucose and our blood calcium levels through these same mechanisms, okay? So this is why we're learning about all this, is to now apply Unit 3 back to what we learned in Unit 1. So before we start talking about how neurons communicate, we're going to define some important terms in electrical flow and we need to, again, differentiate between our channel types. So neurons communicate through electricity, and they do so two ways. We're gonna learn about graded potentials and what those are, and we're gonna talk about action potentials and what those are. So there's two terms, graded potentials that are generally occurring up here at the dendrites, and our action potentials that are being sent from our axon hillock, the trigger zone, down our axons to another neuron. And this happens electrically. At the ends of those axons, we see those synaptic knobs, and this is where neurons are gonna be communicating chemically. They're gonna be releasing neurotransmitters into a synapse to bind with receptors, which will then uh, create a graded electrical signal and eventually an action potential. So we have to go over some of our basic principles of electricity. I'm sorry, some of you guys are like, ah, physics, I got out of this. I don't need this anymore. We need it. So you'll have a better understanding uh, as to how all of this works in our neurons if you can reinvoke your physics class. 
Now, opposite charges attract. So you can see here, we've got a positive and a negative, and they like each other. Uh, maybe you and your loved one, uh, you and your partner are opposites, and that's why you're together. Now, like charges are going to repel each other, and that's important to know. It requires energy to separate those opposite charges across a membrane. So you should hopefully be thinking about things like secondary and primary active transport, okay, uh, where we are utilizing ATP. Now, if opposite charges are separate, we now have potential energy. So here's a couple of examples. Here is a rock sitting on a ledge and it has potential energy while it's sitting there. If we walked up and we added some energy to it and pushed it over the cliff, it would have um, uh, kinetic energy, energy of motion, right? Just like this spring here sitting in this uh, contracted position has potential energy. Then kinetic energy is when those opposite charges are moving toward one another, so the energy of motion. Remember, ions are positively or negatively charged atoms. So we have a neutral atom here. If we lose electrons, we have a cation, and it's positive. If we uh, gain an electron, we have an anion, and it's negative. So the electrical potential then is a difference in concentration of ions between one point and another point. And so we can say it's polarized. So here is a little illustration of this. Over here we have 15 negative charged molecules or atoms. And over here we have three negatively charged particles. And so this creates an electrical potential. Now the current is the flow of those charged particles from one point to another. And remember, uh, these molecules are going to move down their concentration gradient, right? So we're bringing in what we learned about with diffusion. So in this case, we have all of our uh, charged particles over here. They want to move to the right. They want to reach equilibrium, which in this diagram is negative nine, okay? So if we hinder that flow or resist that flow, it's called resistance. And so in our case, this is the plasma membrane, right? We are gonna separate those charges on the extracellular side or the intracellular side, and our plasma membrane is gonna act like our resistor. It's gonna reduce or block the flow of those ions. And then we have uh, our membrane proteins that are gonna allow ions to flow through. So an insulator then is a substance that has high resistance, so like our myelin, and a conductor is a substance with our low resistance. And so our axons are gonna be our conductors in this case. So voltage then is the measure of our potential energy that is generated by separating those charges. So we have this uh, battery here and that battery has some potential energy because those charges are separated, right? We have a positive and a negative up here and until we complete that circuit, we don't have flow. Now, if we add a voltmeter and we put the negative over here and our positive over here, then that energy, those, those electrons are gonna move through and we can measure our current, okay? And we get a little measurement up here for our battery and that tells us uh, about our energy. Now, we can also uh, call voltage our, our potential difference. This is our voltage that's measured between two points. So over here, we can see if we're looking a little bit closer at our plasma membrane, we can take our reference electrode and put it in the extracellular fluid, and we can put our recording electrode in through our plasma membrane into our intracellular space, and then we can look at the difference in charge which gives us about negative 70 millivolts in this case. 
So this is what's called our membrane potential, and we're going to be talking a lot about resting membrane potential. This is the charge difference across our plasma membrane. And in our case, when we talk about our neurons, we're going to be using negative 70 millivolts as our resting membrane potential. You can see that in the cytosol here, it's more negative than, uh, than the extracellular fluid, which is more positive. And do you remember what pump is doing that? Hopefully you said the sodium potassium pump. If you remember, three sodium are moving out, two potassium are moving in, so it's becoming more positive on the outside of the cell and less positive on the inside of the cell or more negative on the inside of the cell. And so we can measure that and that gives us our membrane potential. Remember the potential for these uh, particles to move down a gradient. Now, if we look at Ohm's law, Ohm's law is I equals V over R, where I is our electric current, V is our voltage, and R is our resistance. So if we change that resistance and we increase the resistance, that's going to reduce our electric current. If we increase our voltage, it's going to increase our electric current. So changes in resistance in the neuron are due to the presence of those ion channels. Those are what's going to allow more ions in or out of the cell, and that's going to change our voltage and our electrical currents. So pause the video, practice a little bit here, and I'll see you in a second. All right, welcome back. I hope you uh, were able to digest that a little bit. We have made it to the end of our first lecture on neurons. In our next lecture, we'll be looking at membrane potentials and action potentials and getting a little bit more into the nitty gritty about how our neurons are communicating. Have a great afternoon and I'll see you next time.